Second Peter chapter two. We've been talking uh, over the last uh, month or so. We were we were looking at some videos about things going on in the church called Wide as the Gate. We're talking about what they call the emergent church and uh, New Age teaching, which is not New Age. It's really Old Age. But um, last week we started. It's just going to be like three messages because there's only three chapters in Second Peter. But last week we started talking about how can we prepare ourselves? How can we uh, be ready to defend ourselves against the assault on our faith? Your faith will be assaulted. Uh, and that's nothing new. That went on from the very beginning, as we're going to read here. Uh, there has always been, Satan has always had his, his uh, ministers, uh, angels of light, Paul called them. They, come as, they appear as angels of light. But they're really very deceptive. And they will assault. Satan wants to assault our faith. I said before that, you know, when people that are non-believers, he does everything he can to keep them from hearing the gospel. But people that are believers, he does everything he can to negate or nullify our testimony. So we want to prepare ourselves and arm ourselves. And Peter, in his last letter, uh, equips us for that. Last week we talked about uh, the foundation, uh, chapter 1, about building, uh, you know, uh, the, the precious promises. We have everything we need to live a godly life and how we add to our faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to uh, patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love and the, the growth, the, the effort that we need to make to grow in grace. It doesn't happen automatically. Salvation is a gift. Salvation comes through faith. And once we're saved, it's incumbent upon us to avail ourselves of everything God has given us to grow in grace. And if we allow ourselves to grow in grace, we will be established on God's word. We will be rooted and grounded that when our faith is assailed or assaulted, we'll be able to stand to defend us like a tree planted by rivers of living water, the word tells us in uh, Psalm 1 and in other places. And that's what we want to be. We want to have strong roots. So when the wind comes and when the rain comes, when Hurricane Irene comes, uh, you know, our roots will hold. Uh, so we want to start in chapter 2. We established that faith. We said at the very end of chapter 1, Peter said, you know, we saw, we, I personally saw the glory of God descending upon Christ when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Matthew chapter 17. You can read about that. And Peter, James, and John went with Jesus to the top of the mount, and they saw the glory of God come down upon him. And uh, it was just a blessed time. He said, we saw this with our own eyes. He says, but, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. And Peter said, uh, wrote here in the end of chapter 1, he said, uh, prophecy didn't come in verse 21 of the first chapter. He says, prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the word that we have, the, the scriptures that Peter had at that time, which was the Old Testament, and some of the New Testament letters had been written, uh, but not all at it, it, his time. Most of them had been written. They, they, had, they had begun to collect them as this uh, group of books at the end of the first century and into the second century is when they began to form the New Testament. But most of the letters have been written. Uh, and Peter later on ascribes the letters of Paul as scripture. He calls them scripture. So he's saying that this scripture was not, you know, man didn't think it up. It was not the invention of man. God used men to write it. But it's actually the, the literal words of God. We believe that the Bible is inspired, verbally inspired. They call it verbal plenary inspiration. That means that all the words are the literal words of God. And this is what Peter is saying. <laughs> he says that the uh, prophecy came not. And the word prophecy, by the way, doesn't mean just like, you know, future stuff. Because when we think prophecy, we think telling the future. But just the word of God in general. He said, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Holy men of God. Chapter 2, he says this. But... There were false prophets also among the people. You know, when there's, a, when there's a true one, I guarantee you there's going to be a false one that comes along. And as a matter of fact, there seemed, if you read through the Old Testament, there seemed to have been a whole lot more false ones than true ones. When uh, 
Elijah faced the prophets of Baal. There were, what, like 600 of them? And one of him? Uh, when when uh, the story about uh, uh, Ahab and uh, Jehoshaphat, when, when they were, you know, Ahab wanted to go into battle, and he said, call the prophets. And all these prophets came and said, oh, Ahab, go into battle, go into battle, you're going to win. And Jehoshaphat says, well, do you have any prophets of God around here? And there was one. <laughs> there was one. I think his name was Micaiah. I'm not really sure right now. But there was one prophet, and he's the, he's the only one that came and said, if you go into battle, you ain't coming back. He's the only one that said the truth. And, of course, Ahab had him thrown back in jail. But there's usually more false ones than true ones, okay? And Peter says, there were, there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. There have been false teachers in the church from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Paul addresses a lot of the false teachings, all the, all the writers of the New Testament, in one way or another, address false teachings that existed even in the very first century, in the first decades of the body of Christ, of the church, after the day of Pentecost, after the crucifixion. There were false teachings that crept into the church. And if it happened back then... How much more after 2,000 years would these false teachings uh, morph themselves into different things? When we, when we watched those videos, we saw a lot of the different kinds of false teachings that were coming into uh, play in, in the body of Christ in what's called the church. Uh, and they're really similar. There's really nothing new. They might have different names. A couple of the false teachings that were there in the first couple centuries, just some names, and it's... It's not important. You remember these. I'm not going to give a test later, but uh, we talked about some of these before. There was a group called the Ebionites. Uh, they uh, rejected the pre-existence, the virgin birth of Christ, uh, his deity, uh, his atoning death. Uh, they, they, they liked the writings of James. They didn't like the writings of Paul because Paul talked about saved by grace, and they didn't like that. They were very legalistic. And there are people like that today. There's churches like that today that question the deity of Christ and try to lay a big, you know, a long list of legal stuff on you that you have to do. That uh, usually the leaders of those churches, you know, want you to do them more than they do. But, but there's a lot of legalism. Then there were the Corinthians, what they call the Corinthians. They, uh, they taught that Christ, the, that Jesus was just a man. And when he was baptized, the Christ spirit came upon him. Just like a lot of what we heard when we saw those uh, videos, Why Does the Gate? That, you know, Jesus wasn't really a man, but he's a spirit. That's like the New Age stuff. That's what Oprah teaches, that, you know, uh, Jesus will come on you and all the, all the, other, uh, all the other New Age, you know, Shirley uh, MacLaine and all that stuff. Uh, there were the Nicolaitans that, that uh, they exalted the clergy. You read about them in the Revelation when uh, Jesus mentioned them in the letters <laughs> to the seven churches. They were the group that, be that began to think uh, that, uh, you know, if you were a clergyman, if you were a minister and you were something special, and they began to exalt, you know, this is why, like, in the Catholic Church, the Pope is like, you know, they bow down and kiss his ring, okay, because they exalt the Pope, you know, and they do that in, in it's not just the Catholic churches, but a lot of different churches have their ways of exalting clergy, okay, not just, uh, not just the Catholic Church. Uh, and they, they also promoted immoral lifestyles. They said, hey, you know, uh, if it feels good, do it, that kind of thing. Uh, there were, and, and then there were the Gnostics, and the Gnostics kind of cover, it's sort of like a, a broad brush, it covers a lot of different things. The Gnostics believe that uh, all spirit is good and all matter is evil, and that God could never have a body. They, they believe that God could never ever have a body, and they believe that Jesus was just one of a series of gods that came and so forth. And we can see remnants of these things today, There's just, it's all through all these false teachings, even a lot of the things that we saw in, the, uh, in, that, in, that, in those video presentations is really nothing new. And it all goes back, and I said last week, it all goes back really to the garden. And we're going to see that as we read on a, a little bit here. Uh, he says, but there were false uh, prophets also among the people. This is verse 1 of P Second Peter chapter 2. Who, uh, and there shall be false teachers among you who privately or privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. These false teachers who are coming in to the body of Christ, they'll bring uh, what they call uh, the translation damnable heresies, heresies of destruction. They'll bring in teachings that will lead you to eternal destruction. 
He might say, well, you know, in the church, I mean, we should be able to go to church and hear the truth. We should be able to go to church and, be, and feel secure that if somebody's going to stand behind the pulpit and they're going to preach from the Bible or pretend to preach from the Bible, that what we hear is going to be effective, is going to teach us how to live in ways that's going to lead us to eternal salvation. But there are those that creep into the church, and what they do is they bring in teachings that won't lead you to Christ, that will lead you away from Christ. They'll use the right words. They'll, they'll read certain scriptures and take them out of context and try to twist them, and we'll talk about that a little bit too in a minute. But uh, the, essentially, there are teachers who, their, their purpose, and maybe, maybe they're not, they don't even think they're doing this, but their purpose, they're servants of Satan, and their purpose is to nullify your testimony and to keep people from hearing the gospel and to preach lies and to preach falsehood to lead people to damnation. There are actually people who operate within the body of Christ with that purpose. Uh, they bring in damnable heresies. They deny the Lord that bought them. Now, Peter knew something about denying, okay? Because what did Peter do well, before he was crucified? What did he, uh, before Jesus was crucified, what did he do? He says, I don't know him. He knew what denial was. Have you ever denied Jesus Christ? Since you've been saved, have you ever, have you, has somebody ever come up to you and you knew you had to say something to them about Jesus and you just kept shut up because you were busy or you had something else to do? Pastor Todd was speaking about that Sunday night a little bit, how sometimes we get an opportunity to share our faith and we, we clam up. Maybe because we're afraid, because we're busy, or we think they're not going to like us, or whatever, for whatever reason. There are people, I think every one of us, I've done it, I've denied Christ in my life, and I'm not saying that, you know, proudly, but there have been times when Jesus told me to say something and I didn't. You know, uh, it, we've all done that. Peter knew about denying Christ. But these ones that he's talking about here, they're not just people that are denying Christ like that. They're denying the God, the Lord that bought them. In other words, they're denying who Jesus said he is. They weren't just being, you know, not, weren't just shutting up. But what they do is they teach, they bring you teachings that go against the teachings of the scriptures that tell us who Jesus is. They take the scriptures uh, out of here and they take them out of context and they'll, and they'll put their own little spin on things and they'll try to tell you, <clears throat> I mean, I've heard, I've heard him say, and I was going to bring some clips tonight, but I just didn't, I just, uh, I just didn't do it. But, you know, we've, we've heard some of the teachers, they'll come up to you and uh, one guy came up and said, well, Jesus, Jesus was the first born again man. They're denying who Jesus is. Jesus didn't have to be born again. He was God. He didn't have to be, become a new creature like you or I. I had to be born again. Because I was lost in sin. I was, I was, I was a sinner. I was, I was uh, 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 an adulterer. I was a fornicator. I was a, I was a blasphemer. I was all those things that we, it talks about us before we were saved. I was all that stuff. Jesus was never that stuff. He didn't have to be born again. They'll tell you that Jesus had to go suffer in hell. Jesus didn't have to go suffer. He didn't have anything to suffer for. He suffered on the cross. But what they do... They take the Lord, the, 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 you know, the, the Lord that bought them, Jesus Christ who died for them, and they deny who he was. They deny what he did. They try to, they try to twist and turn, and they, they really try to make a liar out of God. It says, we, we saw in that, in, that, uh, in that video, there was one who said that uh, uh, believing in the atoning death of Christ was almost like an embarrassment. Remember, hearing, uh, you heard something, one of the emergent leaders said something along those lines. Believing in the, in, in the atoning death of Christ is my only hope. It's not an embarrassment. That's why he came. They deny the Lord that bought them. And they bring upon themselves swift destruction. We're going to see in this passage about three or four times when Peter reminds us their end. People, false teachers, who purposely and uh, uh, intentionally preach false doctrine, they will have an end. They will answer to God. They will have to pay for what they've done. Okay? Their, dis their destruction, they bring it upon themselves swift destruction. Verse 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. They'll pack churches out with thousands of people. We, see, we see, saw it in those videos and we see it today. Churches with 20,000 members, 40,000 members. They go every Sunday morning to get a pep talk about how to live a good life. How to be good. How to be successful. How to be, you know, seven steps to this and 40 days of that and whatever, you know. They, 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 they go and they hear this stuff, but they never hear the gospel. They never hear the truth. Paul, these are the people that Paul talked about, the ones who have itching ears. They'll, they'll heap to themselves teachers that will tell them everything they want to hear. And they'll pack places out. Now, there's, listen, there's some good 
big churches. I'm not, I've always said this. Whenever we talk like this, I'm not putting down big churches where the word is preached because there's a lot of churches where I believe that are large and, and, the, and the pastors preach God's word. But we're talking about the, uh, the celebrity preachers that we see today. They didn't have TV back in Peter's day, you know. I wonder what he would say if he could come back today and see and hear some of the stuff on, uh, on, uh, on, Christian, on Christian TV. Now, Peter might have some, some strong words to say about that. Many shall follow them. You know, you think about that. I always, I always thought about this. What if Paul could come back today and, and stand on a street corner and see people walk past? I wonder what he would think. That's, that's, that's a sidelight. I'm, I'm not going to get off on that track. But it says, Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of the truth shall be evil spoken of. By all these big movements and these mega churches and all these people that go to these churches, and some of these preachers that get on TV and do this stuff, it actually brings reproach upon the true gospel. Because I don't know how many times, I can tell you, when I worked in Allegheny Lillum Steel Company, I started to talk to somebody about Jesus, the first thing they would bring up was money. First thing they would bring up was money. Why? Because a lot of the preachers that we hear on, see on TV today, what do they talk about? They talk about money. Money. That's why I like to talk about money. I preached about money here a couple, a month or so ago. I mean, Jesus talks a lot about money. Nothing wrong with money. Money is a tool. But God shows us how to use it. But these ones that come on TV, they talk about getting your money in their pocket. Okay. <laughs> it's a little different. They ain't talking about how to use your money. And they'll, and they'll use, they'll, again, I had some clips. Maybe I should have brought them. But, you know, sow your $1,000 seed, you know, your $58 plan. I'll send you a free book and, and all this stuff. And we've, we've seen it before. We've heard it before. It's, 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 they're, they're, they cause, to, they bring reproach upon the body of Christ. They bring reproach upon the gospel because a lost and dying world will automatically associate when you say you're Jesus, they'll associate you with one of, these, one of these folks on TV that asks for money. That's just kind of like a natural reaction that I experienced anyway. Verse 3, and this goes on with that thought. And through covetousness, through uh, uh, the, the, their, their, their method, of, their mode of operation, okay, their foundation is covetousness. That means... Stuff that they want. They want more. And they play upon our natural desire to want more. Okay? Now, in the spirit, you know, we shouldn't be covetous. In the spirit, we shouldn't, you know, have a, this driving desire to have more and more and more and more stuff. But they appeal to the fleshly nature of man, just like Satan did. What did Satan say to Eve? You could be like God. Did he say you couldn't eat of every tree in the garden? Their, their, their foundation is covetousness. And look what he says. And through covetousness they w shall they with feigned words, lies. Their vehicle is lies. Their foundation is greediness and covetousness. Their vehicle is untruth, is lies. They take the word and they lie about it. They make stuff up. I, I was, as I was watching, uh, looking at some clips today, there was one of them that actually said, do you know what Adam's sin was? Do you know what this guy said Adam's sin was? He didn't tithe. <laughs> that was, I'm, I'm serious. I was watching this guy, and he, if I can mention his name, you would know who he is. He's a popular guy. And he said, he said Adam, you know, he, in reality, he didn't tithe. I said, wow, well, I mean, <laughs> but you know, and needless to say, he was, he was teaching people how they should tithe. And I believe in tithing. You know, don't get me wrong. I do. I do myself. But not because Adam didn't do it. But they, that's their lies. They make things up. This whole, this whole doctrine about Jesus suffering in hell, they made it up. It's not in the Bible. There's nothing in the Bible that even reflects that. But this is, this is the assault from within. They, they, they make this stuff up. They're, through covetousness is their foundation. Lies are their vehicle. And what is their goal? They make merchandise of you. They see you as a big dollar sign. When they go into an arena and there's, there's 20,000 people there, they see 20,000 dollar signs sitting in them seats. That's why they do what they do. And some of them are good at it. That's why they get them. That's why they, when they have these telethons, you see the same ones every time. Why? Because they work. It works. They want to get somebody who's going to raise the most money. 
Nothing wrong with taking an offering. You know, our local TV station, they take an offering two, three times a year. Nothing wrong with that. They have to. They've got to pay the bills. They, don't sell, they can't sell commercial time. or They can sell some, but not a lot. So they've got to raise money. Nothing wrong with that. But when they lie to get your money, that's what they do. Some of these people are going, they lie. To get, they make stuff up to get your money. It's, their foundation is covetousness. Their vehicle is lies. And their goal is to get the money out of your pocket and put it in there. I'm not making that up. This is what we see every day. He says, and it's nothing new. You know, they didn't have satellite TV back then, but they had them back then. He said, and, and again, he reminds us of their, of their judgment, whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. They're going to get theirs. They're going to get theirs. You just imagine being one of these preachers who, who have led people to hell by telling lies. They're going to have to stand before God and answer for every soul that they led to hell. Every, every old lady that they ripped off, telling them lies. They're going to pay for that. You know, sometimes we think, boy, I'd like to get them. Don't worry. They're going to be there. People, I want to tell you something else. We're going to take it a step further. You know, sometimes people, it seems like people get away with stuff. Nobody gets away with nothing. I was talking with my sis. We knew a situation where a fellow took advantage of an older woman, got her money. It seemed like he got away with it. He didn't get away with nothing. I'm thinking he better enjoy that money now because eternity in hell is a long time. And that's what, that's what, that's what they're going to look at. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. Peter tells us that's going to happen right here. He says, verse 4, For God spared not the angels of sin. Now, he gives us some examples of judgment when he's talking about all this, uh, how, these, how these people are going to suffer judgment. He gives us some examples of judgment. He gives us three examples of judgment. One is the fallen angels. For if God spared not the fallen angels of sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved under judgment. He's talking probably, and really this is kind of one of those passages that you can, you, some people have disagreements on, but I believe he's talking about some of the fallen angels, the ones before the flood, who uh, uh, cohabited with, with men, who influenced men before the flood, when uh, men were evil, you know, their thoughts were evil and wicked continually, and you read about that back in Gen uh, Genesis. He says they are going to be uh, constrained, they have been constrained, delivered down to hell. That word Tartarus that's translated hell here. It's the only place where that word is used in the New Testament. It's really a Greek word and it's, it's, it's out of Greek philosophy. It's the place of the damned dead that they believe. So these, these angels are in torment. These are not obviously all the fallen angels because we believe that demons are fallen angels and they're, they're, they're tormenting us now. But these are those ones that left their first estate Jude talks about. He gives us another example of, of judgment that is to come. It says in verse 5, And spared not the old world, uh, but saved Noah, <laughs> the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Again, uh, connected with the, the last verse, we know that when, when Noah was alive, God looked upon him, he repented him that he created man, because their thoughts were only evil and wicked continually. And he, uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, he and his sons and their wives. They built the ark, we know that, and God sent judgment on the earth. Uh, that was the, the world uh, before the flood. And then we read in verse 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those after, who after uh, should live ungodly. So we see three examples here of God's judgment. We see God's judgment of darkness, and God's judgment of a flood, and God's judgment of fire. God will judge the wicked. Don't ever feel, you know, sometimes you feel like, God, when are you going to do something? God will judge the wicked. It's guaranteed. He judged these wicked. And I, there's a time coming, and I've talked before about the cup of wrath that is in God's hand right now. It's being filled up. All this stuff we're seeing, you know, and I know I don't want to be the dead horse, but, you know, we've got an earthquake and a hurricane in one week. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't remember an earthquake like that around here. 
I didn't feel it, by the way. I don't know. I, I, Rose and I were cutting up peppers and tomatoes, so we didn't feel it. We were in the kitchen. But, but they, a lot of people felt it around here. We haven't had an earthquake around here in a long time like that. What would have been a six? A, what was the year, John? Nine? That was up in, up in Cleveland. I remember that one. That one wasn't as big as this one. That was like a, yeah, that was like a, about half the size of this one, I think. But that, I know, I was in a car, I was, I was parked somewhere, and I felt like a little, hmm, that one back in 86, I, I remember that one. But, you know, a big one. But what, what if, and I, I mentioned this before, what if that would have been a 6.8? Just think, look at all the damage that was done by the 5.8 in the shake, and if it would have been, you know, they say that's like double the intensity, every number it goes up, it's like double the intensity. And we had this, and we had this hurricane, a category one hurricane, but it sure did a lot of damage, didn't it? Still doing damage, some places are... They won't, they won't come out of it. But, you know, you can't stop wind, and you can't stop rain, and you can't stop it when the earth moves. When God begins to send judgment, see, and I've said before, this isn't necessarily the judgment of God, but it's a warning from God. But people aren't listening. They're not paying attention. He sent a flood on the earth. Now, of course, the word says that he'll never destroy the earth again with a flood. He sent a rainbow to, to, to promise us that. And he, sent, he put the angels in darkness, and he sent fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. This is, you know, this is just a picture of what God can do. And I believe we've been seeing little hints of God's judgment in our, in our world in the last few years. Uh, and it's, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse because the world's getting worse. Okay? These examples of judgment. Then he gives us an example of deliverance. It says in verse 7, he delivered, even in the midst of Sodom and Gomorrah, he delivered this fellow named Lot. Okay, who's Lot? When we were studying Genesis, who's Lot? He was Abraham's nephew, you remember? And when Abraham and Lot were, you know, when the, when the place wasn't big enough for the both of them, he said, Lot, he said, you, you, where you go, I'll go the other direction. Lot looked at Sodom. He said, that place looks pretty nice. Nice city, well-watered well-watered plain? I think I'll take that. He did, but he ended up in the middle of a cesspool. But even though Lot might not have been, you know, the brightest bulb in the bunch, okay, and even though he might not have been the most spiritual, even though he might have been carnal, it says right here that Lot was a just man. It says that Lot was a saved man. He didn't act like it all the time. And you wonder, if, you know, if he was that saved, why did you choose to go to Sodom? I, don't, I can't answer for it. We've talked about that before. You can listen to those messages. But he said he delivered Lot. Do you know that when God sends judgment on this world, I believe that he's going to deliver his church. He's going to deliver those who are really his. It's called the rapture of the church. Now, a lot of stuff can happen. A lot of natural stuff can happen. Because a lot of people think, oh yeah, you think the rapture is going to happen and you're going to escape all this... A lot of stuff can happen before the rapture happens. Politically, uh, in, in the natural realm, a lot, of, a lot of bad things can happen and probably will happen before the rapture happens. Because we're not talking about the wrath of God right now. What we're seeing is just a glimpse, just a hint of what God can do. When God begins to pour out His wrath, it's going to be unlike anything this world has ever seen. And I believe, just like He delivered just a lot, He's going to deliver the church. He says over in Thessalonians, we are not appointed unto wrath. We're not appointed unto his wrath. So when that rapture happens, we're going to be taken out like Lot was taken. Listen to what he says. Lot was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Lot lived in Sodom. He liked Sodom, but he didn't like what was going on. And I said, well, Lot, why didn't you just get up and leave? They had to drag him out when the, when, the, uh, when the angels came. They had to grab him, you know, and drag him out. For that righteous man, in verse 8, dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. There is, again, he's reminding us of the difference between those that really love him and those that don't. We're going to be delivered. My judgment was placed on Christ at the cross. I'm not going to suffer or experience the judgment of God. I'm not going to experience his wrath. I've not been appointed to that because of the blood of Jesus. But the rest, my God, it's going to be a horrible time. It's going to be a horrible time when he pours his wrath out. He says, now he goes on and he, and he begins to describe the character of these false teachers. He's talked about the way they operate. He's talked about a number of times about their judgment. Now he talks about their character. Listen to what he says in verse 10. 
but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. These ones crave polluted things. They, 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 have, they have this un, in, insatiable lust for polluted things. They speak great words. They talk about God. They talk about Jesus. But deep down inside, they want stuff. And they want women. And they want fame. And they want power. And they want sex. And they want, and they want, and they want, and they've learned how to get it. They're just like, you know, rock stars with a cross on. <laughs> you know, okay, you know. Some, at least the rock stars aren't ashamed to, <laughs> they just do what they do. These guys have to put on a cloak, okay. They, they have this insatiable desire. It says in verse... 10. They walk after the, lust, uh, after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness. They despise government. They scorn authority. Man, I tell you, I, I can't tell you how many people I know who say, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. They scorn authority. And you know something, when we first started in the first few years of this church, I think it's like this with, any, with anybody that plants a church. You get a wave of people in who are looking for the perfect church. You know what I'm saying? You got a wave of people who can never find, oh, I've been to this one, I've been to that one, I'm looking for the perfect church. And the thing is, they'll never find it. You know why? Because most of those people, they do not want to submit to authority. God's church, when, when God set up his church, when Jesus set up his church, he, he gave levels of authority in the church. Of course, he's the, the ultimate authority. Whether you're in an independent church, or whether you're in a denominational church, or wherever it might be, Christ has to be the ultimate authority. If the leaders of a church or denomination don't answer to him, then it's just, it's just a club. It's just another vehicle, you know, for making money. For, for it, 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 it's, it's, its own existence is its own, it's its own goal, just to keep existing. If Christ is the head of the church, then the goal of the church is to win souls and increase the kingdom of God. Okay? It says that they despise governments. They despise authority. It goes on and he says they're presumptuous. Uh, they, 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 they take upon themselves, they're self-willed. They think they know everything, and you're not going to tell them any different. I've encountered a few folks like that. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> they, they, there are people that have like their pet things, okay? They have their pet things. And if you don't go along with their pet thing, you're of the devil. It's, you know... People have this stuff that they, they latch on to. And I mean, there's some doctrines we need to latch on to. Please don't misunderstand me, the, the, you know, the, the basic doctrines of the church. But I'm talking about things, you know, when you get talking about, you know, end time stuff, you get talking about organizational stuff, you get talking about, you know. People get these things that become their pet little projects. And if you don't, if you don't jump on their bandwagon, I, told, I, I had some guy tell me, you know, you need to leave the church of God. And I said... Why? He says, why are you in there? I said, well, that's where God put me. No, I, I mean, it's not the greatest church, but I mean, they have the, the doctrines right, and that's, I'm here because that's where God put me. I mean, you know, if they get goofy, I'm going to leave. He says, you need to leave the church of God. I said, how come? He says, they got a 501c3. You know, non-profit thing. I said, yeah, so? He says, well, that means the government's your sovereign. You know, you sold out to the government. I said, no, I haven't. I said, what are you talking about? Yeah, and this, this was this guy saying, now, of course, this guy doesn't go to church anywhere. <laughs> okay? Because, you know, yeah, you know. He says, uh, he says well, you know, uh, you, can't, you know, you can't go against the government. I said, yes, I can. He says, they'll come and throw you out your church. I said, let them throw me out my church. You know, they can fix the roof if they want to. I don't care. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. It's, but see, people grab onto those things like that, and they'll, and they'll make a big production out of it, and they'll get all the, they'll just read this and read that. And I said, listen, leave me alone. Go tell somebody about Jesus. Go, to, go, go invite somebody into, in, 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 into the body of Christ. Start your own church without a five one, for goodness sakes. I, I don't care. It doesn't matter. People take things that don't mean anything, and they make it mean something. Why? Because it means it makes them feel like they're something special. And if you don't go along with their program, you're serving the devil. I said, well, okay. You know, 
That's what they do. They despise authorities. They're presumptuous. They think they know everything, and if you disagree with them, then you ain't nobody. Okay? They're self-willed. They don't care what God thinks. They try to pretend like they do, but they don't really care what God thinks. They're self-willed. They, 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 they do what they think is right, and if you don't agree, well, that's just, that's just what they do. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities or dignitaries. They're not afraid to profane holy things. Nothing's holy. They'll make a mockery out of holy things. There's a bunch out today who, who uh, you ever see these guys, they talk about token the ghost? You ever see that? They say, they say, they, they, they liken the Holy Spirit to smoke and reefer. Yeah, and I ain't making that up. You can see these guys on YouTube. They'll get there and they'll say, and there are these guys that they'll be talking and they'll go, whoa, 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 in the middle of their talking and they'll get all kind of goofy. And they'll say, oh, and what they do is they go like this. They say, smoke the ghost. And they go, like this. Yeah. I'm not making that up. And what they do is, listen, what they do is they do that and they hyperventilate and they make themselves dizzy and they think, <laughs> they say, man, I'm in the spirit now, you know. You can watch them on YouTube. I'm, I'm not making it up. I couldn't make something like that up. And people are flocking. They're going to see these guys. They say, oh, man, we're getting high on uh, uh, Jehovah Wana. They say, Jehovah Wana. Jehovah Wana. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there. It says that they speak evil. That nothing is holy to them. They profane. My God, how can we take the Christ that died for us and turn him into a drug. That's what they say. We laugh about it. But it's tragic. But this is, they're creeping in. They were, they were back in Peter's day. I don't know if they smoked reefer back in Peter's day, but they did stuff like that back then, and they're doing it now, and people are eating it up. It says, verse 11, he says, angels, which are greater in power and might, Bring not ruling accusation against them before the Lord. Angels are afraid to speak evil of people. They're, they're careful about what they say. But these, uh, verse 12, as natural brute, brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, again, their judgment, they speak evil of things that they don't understand and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Anything that they can't fully understand or don't want to understand, they'll bring into ill repute. That's why you hear people say things like, oh, never ask for God's will. You know, that's, that's your, your sinning if you ask for God's will. Well, they tell us in the Word to pray if it be your will. You know, Jesus said that. They, they, they make a mockery out of the truth if they don't understand it, if they don't agree with it, or if it disagrees with their teaching, Okay. It says, verse 13, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that counted pleasure to riot in the daytime. They like to party. See, this is their, their behavior now. They party. We talked about their character. We talked about their mode of operation. Now, this is their behavior. They like, they, every, everything is a party. It says, they count a pleasure to riot in the daytime, verse 13, spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. What a description. They're, they're sex addicts. They've, they've learned that their position of power and their position of authority affords them the ability to attract women. Like, you know, like Christian groupies, right? You know, we, we don't like to think about that, but it's there. I remember uh, a number of years ago, I was up at Teen Challenge. And we went to, I went to do a service, and there was a guy there who came up and said, do you mind if I play keyboard with you for, for the worship service? I said, no. And he came up and played, and he was good. He was really good. So after the service, I got to talking to him. And he said that he had been a, uh, a worship leader and like a youth pastor in a big church. 
He was married. He had a, he had a wife and, and, a do- and a son and a daughter. He said things start happening in his life, and things got messed up, and he ended up smoking crack. He ended up becoming a crack addict. So he ended up in Teen Challenge. And he was telling me his daughter had been involved in recording, I guess she was an older daughter, uh, with, with certain names of, uh, of uh, gospel singers. Again, if I said some of the names, you would recognize them. And what he told me, he said, he, he, and he told me this, and he had no reason to say this to me. He, he had, you know, he was, you know, he, he had no reason to, to make this up. He said, he said, the gospel, the, 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 the gospel music world is just as evil as MTV. That the people that make records and the people, all these, you know, gospel singers, the people who exalt them and think they're great, he said, they're just, they're just as, as pernicious as, as, as uh, you know, ACDC. They just wear like a nicer suit. It's a shame that with people in positions of leadership in the church and and people that other people look up to can't control their own physical desires. He says here, they have eyes full of adultery and they can't cease from sin. They have beguiling, unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. And he compares them here with a fellow named Balaam. He says, they've forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. You can read about him back in Numbers chapter 22 and 23. He was the one that was rebuked for his iniquity that, uh, with a, a, a donkey spoke to him. He wouldn't listen to God, so God spoke to a donkey. He forbade the madness of the prophet. Verse 17, we're closing. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. We keep hearing about their judgment over and over and over again. God says, they're going to get theirs. Peter says, they're going to get theirs. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. They target... Listen, this is, this, is, this is Satan within the body. Next week we're going to read about his attacks from outside the body. But this is how he has infiltrated the body. They promise them liberty. But they themselves are the servants of corruption. You know, a slave can't promise liberty to anybody. And these leaders are slaves to sin. These ones he's talking about, these false teachers, they're slaves to sin. They might talk a good game. They might look it on the outside. But you, uh, Jesus said, you know the tree by its fruit. It says they're the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, this is where it gets really scary. I tell folks, you want to go in ministry? James said like this. He says, don't want to be a teacher. Don't be a teacher. Don't be a preacher. Because if you are, you're going to be held to a standard. See, it's one thing if just a normal everyday Joe does what he does. But if somebody stands up here and preaches the word, we're held to a standard. He says, if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end, it would have been better if they had never heard the word. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. You know, it's one thing if you've got people that never heard the word and they go do what they do. But if you've heard the word and you've believed it and you've taken steps to try to, you know, allow God to change your life and you go back to where you're going for, he says it's like a dog going back to his vomit and the sow that was washed in her wallowing in the mire. You know, you can take a pig, clean it up, Put a pretty bow on its back. You know, put some perfume on it. You know, put some you know pretty stuff on it. Make it look a little little pretty pig. <laughs> if you if you stick it back in the barn, you know where it's going to end up. Right back in the mud. Right back in the mud. You know. See, Peter is telling us. He in chapter one he gave us the foundation, the foundation that we need to be solid. Now he's warning us about those who are to come. I can't believe, it's, it's amazing to me how gullible saints can be. 
You know, it's amazing to me. I've always been kind of a skeptic. So I've, I've, I've never really believed anything firsthand. I've always been kind of... But it's amazing to me what people will eat up. Went to a meeting. I think it was last year, year before last. And uh, actually, I went to this meeting. It's like a yearly thing they have. And a couple years ago, we went. And it was really good. Uh, good music, good worship. Paul Wilbur was there. You know Paul Wilbur. Praise Adonai. Love a great time. They had, they had the worshipers and dance. And it was beautiful. It was a great meeting. I said, wow. So that was like a couple, two years ago. Last year, we couldn't wait to go. We said, man, we're going to go to this meeting. It was really good last year. We went. And it was chaos. Unbelievable. We went and I was looking at Rose. I said, what, what's going on here? Unbelievable. And in the very, the very uh, end, the, the last service, it was Saturday night, Paul Wilbur had played some songs and he was doing a little bit of preaching and some people got, were getting words, you know. And this was, this was maybe, I mean, it might have been maybe a couple thousand people. It was like in a gym. And people were getting words from God. Mm, okay. okay. And went over here, we get a word. It's good. You know, okay. It's the word. Okay. We're listening. I'm listening. I always listen. You know, okay. Okay. And everybody was, mm. And a guy over here, matter of fact, he was in one of the dance troops. He got a word. He said, this is Michael the Archangel. I said, I, said, I want to get out of here. <laughs> but, but listen, I, I looked at the press release, and they said, oh, we had a great time. Oh, it was, I was reading, oh, God really moved. And I'm thinking, those people were mixed up. God don't move. Yeah, Lucifer, <laughs> an angel of light. I said, God didn't move. People, people eat that stuff up but they don't check it with God's Word. I don't want to hear from Michael the Archangel. I believe that God could speak. I believe in the Word of Knowledge and Word of Wisdom, and I believe in that. We, you know, I thank God when He visits us, and, and we, we get words from Him through, through, our, uh, you know, through folks in, in the body. I believe in that. I want more of it. But I want to make sure it's God. If somebody stands up and says, this is Michael the Archangel, I'm going to say, you better sit down. I don't want to hear from Michael the Archangel. And it was something because... Paul Wilbur, and, and I like Paul Wilbur, I like his music, okay. He was standing up there with the mic, and this was going on. And when he said that, I, I looked at Paul Wilbur, and Paul, he was like a deer with, with the headlights in his eyes. He was like, he didn't know what to do, you know. I mean, I, I, you know, if I'd have been in his position, I might have, been fr I might have froze up too, I don't know. But, but you see, but people eat that stuff up. I want, I want one time, I'm, I'm going to close, I'm rambling on. I always tell people about rambling on, I don't want to start doing it. A long time ago, Rose and I took the kids down to a healing explosion. Down at the Civic Arena. Okay. If I gave the names of the folks, you wouldn't know who I was talking about. The people who were running. They had everybody up. They said, they said we're, gonna, we're all going to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. I said, whew, baptized in the Holy Ghost. I was anyhow, but I said, okay. Yeah, everybody stand up and they say, here's what you got to do. Start saying words real fast. If you say words, start fa if you start saying them fast enough, you'll be talking in tongues. We got up and left. We said, I'm out of here. I believe in talking in tongues. I thank God. I've, God blessed me with that, you know, the gift of the, the Holy Spirit in talking in tongues. But that's not the way you don't, you know what? If God fills you with the Holy Spirit, nobody's going to have to tell you what to say. You start talking. <laughs> you won't be able to stop. You won't be able to shut up. Nobody has to tell you to put your lips together and start, you know, making words, making sounds. When the Holy Ghost jumped in me, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. There wasn't nobody around to hear me think I was crazy. I was all by myself. But, but okay. See, but, but people eat that stuff up. We're gullible. But you know what? You go back to first, uh, Second Peter chapter 1, and you read about the foundation. Get a good foundation. I thank God that when I got saved, I went to a church. I had a pastor. He, was, he didn't have a, a master's degree in divinity, but he preached God's word. And I got a foundation. I got a, I got a good foundation. So when I run into them things, I can say, that's nonsense. I'm not buying that. Amen?